Greetings. This is Arthur Fleischer, Professor of Radiology and OBGYN at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Nashville, Tennessee. I'm sure all of you are disappointed that the AIUM could not occur this year. It would have been the 46th consecutive AIUM for me, but we do have this ability to record the presentation and hopefully exchange ideas. This is a discussion of early sonographic detection of ovarian cancer with labeled microbubbles. I want to acknowledge my co-authors, Charles Kasky, PhD from the Vanderbilt Imaging Institute, Dr. Andre Lushak, who was a resident and fellow here at Vanderbilt, and Dr. Ron Alvarez, who is the chairman of OBGYN at Vanderbilt and renowned OBGYN GYN oncologist. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, we have been working with microbubbles uh, for several years. The objectives of this presentation is to discuss new concepts concerning ovarian cancer and how they could impact on early detection of ovarian cancers. So I'll be presenting the type 1 versus type 2 epithelial ovarian cancer and discuss the potential of label microbubbles. I'm also going to describe optimization of the tube and ovary, discuss the initial works with label microbubbles in a murine model, describe the first in-human studies performed at Stanford, and hopefully stimulate thoughts of future research. If one looks at ovarian cancer, it is a variety of histologies, the most lethal of which of course, is the epithelial adenocarcinomas, and namely the serous cystadenocarcinomas that have very poor five-year survival. The recent work has described a difference between a type 1 ovarian cancer, which is slow-growing, developed from the epithelial layer, is low-grade serous endometroid clear cell mucinous, um, and has associated CRAS and BRAS gene mutations. These are associated with a long five-year survival. As opposed to the type two that are rapidly growing, high-graded presentation, P53 mutations associated with BRCA mutations. These are described as high-grade serous cystadenocarcinoma. They actually arise from the tubal epithelium and they have short five-year survival. This diagram shows the difference between the type 1 that arises from the epithelial layer and has a relatively benign course versus the type 2 that arise actually from the fimbriated end of the fallopian tube and invaginate into the ovary and form uh, tumors. And it's a completely different process uh, compared to the type 1. Uh, we can see from this uh, slide the statistics of survival that survival in the type 2 shown in red is much less than type 1 and also depends on the stage at which it is discovered. So these are some beautiful diagrams from Kerman and their work uh, changing really the understanding of ovarian cancer. Again, the type 2 arising from the fimbriated end of the tube, um, extending into the ovary through a rent, usually related to ovulation. Um, if there is a um, P53 mutation associated with that, it develops into the so-called stick lesion, serous tubal intraepithelial carcinoma. Um, these, again, shed into the ovary versus a different type of pattern when there's CRAS or BRAF uh, mutations developing into borderline tumors and low-grade serous carcinomas. There is also uh, theories about the development of endometroid cancer and clear cell cancers from endometriotic implants. I think it's important for us in ultrasound to try to develop a technique to identify the tube and its relationship to the ovary. 
this was done uh, in several studies when we first looked at tubal patency and using contrast. A recent study from the University of Kentucky showed a very high percentage, in fact, of seeing the tube when one could see the ovary. These are basically descriptions of the tubal segments, as you can see here. Um, and here is a picture lent to me by Dr. Benassaraf showing a 3D depiction of um, uterus with tubes that were clearly seen surrounded by a site. And here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the anatomy that we're looking at and the images on ultrasound. We also, as I said, learned a lot um, looking at the tubal identification when we did sonohistography and sonosalpingography. Um, these are some pictures from those uh, studies. As you can see, the tube is very well seen using positive contrast. When we start to look at the tube, we begin to appreciate the proximal portion of the tube as it invaginates in the fundal region. And the distal tube can be traced to the area around the ovary as beautifully shown on this image. This is a recent 3D um, which shows both the uterus and the tube uh, beautifully. So it has been shown that over many years that uh, ovarian cancers can actually originate in the tube. This is an older example of an ovarian cancer that is contiguous with the tube as identified by endosalpingeal falls and incomplete septations. This is the growth specimen with the hemostat on the abnormal tube and the low power uh, microscopy. This was another tumor uh, arising from the fimbriated end of the tube where there was actually a venous type waveform. And as you can see from the histology, there are abnormal vessels arising in the fimbriated end of the tube. This is another example of an ovarian cancer, which actually arised in the tube. As you can see, there's a cluster of very abnormal signals surrounding this ovary. When it comes to labeled microbubbles, we can put the ligand on, a, on the shell of the microbubble because the microbubble shell is a lipid and uh, we can attach things to it. This is a diagram uh, which shows basically early on the microbubbles can attach to various antibodies in the um, at one minute, and then those that are still attached at seven minutes, you can see are actually labeled. When we look at the markers on an endothelial cell surface, we can look at angiogenesis, inflammation, and thrombosis. And this is a basic diagram of what it would look like with a microbubble and the strep avidin biotin, so called glue, uh, to put the antibody onto the microbubble. Uh, Andre did a lot of work using this uh, scanner, which is a very high frequency scanner, uh, has wonderful resolution in the first couple of centimeters. Uh, and here's a picture of it being used in a mouse model. Basically, uh, the micro bubbles are injected. After about three minutes, there's a high mechanical index which breaks the micro bubble and eventual replacement. Uh, this also shows the initial uh, uh, path of the micro bubbles and how uh, we can calculate or get a good idea of the amount of labeled micro bubbles attachment to wherever we're trying to show. And um, this is an example on uh, video. So the image on the right, the green dots are actually labeled uh, sites in the tumor. And we can see this. Um, in a video format um, in this um, marine tumor. So Andre was able to report differences in high VEGF versus low VEGF tumors and correlate that with the Western blot immunofluorescence. This is another example of a tumor uh, with high VEGF content and labeling versus low VEGF content in ovarian cancers. This was the preliminary work 
um, as the image on the top shows a definite signal in a serous cystadenocarcinoma versus on the bottom no signal in benign serous cystadenofibromas. This is further evaluation of other tumors that are similar, clear cell serous cystadenocarcinoma and Brenner tumors. So as I would like to conclude by saying labeled microbubbles afford targeted sonographic detection of tumor neovessels. And this capability has the potential, I believe, of finding type two ovarian cancers, which are the ones that are highly malignant and can metastasize uh, to the peritoneum. Label microbubbles have been fabricated by incorporating the strep avidin attachment into the lipid shell. And further clinical and preclinical research is warranted. So some questions, how to optimize the 3D depiction of the tube and ovary, how to focus on a potential specific biomarker for the stick lesions, and finally, does that have any relationship to individualized treatment of ovarian cancer? I want to dedicate uh, my talk and recognize the pioneering work of Jurgen Willman from Stanford, and also dedicate uh, this presentation to Howard Jones, who was the chairman of OBGYN and oncologist and wonderful individual. And I want to basically acknowledge their input into this ongoing study and others listed here that I'm very grateful to have as collaborators. Thank you. Labeling. This is the first